90% of our revenues were inside the United States. Uh, now, today, in 2009, we have a $100 billion company outside the United States alone. So we are, we are a multitude bigger, and, and uh, our business outside the United States is growing faster than the business inside the U.S. So the notion of how to manage a global company and how to keep that going forward uh, is foremost on my mind. I would say it boils down to ultimately a couple of fundamentals. Uh, first, it has to do with people. Uh, we have to constantly be focused on recruiting, training, and developing the world's best people. We try to instill in them a sense for the culture of GE, but at the same time giving them the freedom to act, to win in their own markets. We try to give them, build careers where they're, they're broad and deep at the same time, and it starts with a great, uh, great human resource practice. The second thing, I think, is really a focus on customers. And in GE, we strive very hard to make sure that the relationships with customers on a global basis is personal, not impersonal, that the leaders have great relationships with customers like Alliance or, or other customers and partners we have in a country like India, and that we don't act like a customer in Chicago gets better treatment than a customer in Delhi. We build processes and practices every place we go. And the third one, and maybe the most important one, is how we interface with society and with government, because it's very important to be a long-term player. I always say simply, to be a great global company, you have to know how to make money in a country for your investors, and you have to know how to make money for a country so you're welcome over the long term. And it's this dual purpose of knowing how to make money in a country and for a country is what makes you a welcome part and, and a welcome investor no matter how long you're around. Uh, the last thing I would say is that the unique role of the CEO, I think, in globalization is, uh, is twofold. The first one is picking, you know, wins the time. You know, because the world's a big place. You can't be all things to all people in, in every country. But you have to sense when a country is going through some kind of change where you really want to drop the anchor deep. You know, I, I was in, in, in Indonesia this week. We've been in Indonesia for 80 years. But you get the sense that this may be the moment to drop and build deeper roots in Indonesia, make more investment, because that country might be, might be, be getting ready for this kind of uh, progress. So the first job of the CEO is to, is to sense the moment of time. And the second uh, job of the CEO is to continue to be flexible as things change. You know, um, Jack Welch, since the moment of time for India, was 1991. He sent us all here, myself included, because he said, you know, uh, uh, there's a great leader in India right now. They've got smart people. This is the time to come to India. You know, he was right, but for all the wrong reasons. You know, the original projection was that the market was going to grow. It didn't grow for probably a decade. But what we discovered when we came here was the, the vast resource of tremendous human talent. And that's how we built uh, BPO. That's how we built a tech center in Bangalore. So the CEO has two jobs, knowing the moment of time and then having constancy of purpose over the long term because nothing's ever perfect. Uh, things change rapidly. And that, that sense of timing and endurance, I think, is what, is what we have to do to make globalization really work. You know, Jeff, uh, listening to you talk about Jack, Jack Welch reminds me of 1988. And it's uh, a CII mission led by Ratan Tata, uh, Rahul Bajaj, uh, Jamshed Gaudaj, and myself. And we were trips out at 6 in the morning to your corporate headquarters. And in 1988, he was really negative about India. You can't do business in India. But I'm so glad it's changed. <laughs> and exactly. you're here and, it, and you're doing sure. well. Mukesh, let me turn to you. Um, your company has become really a major leader and, and it's a, seen as a very successful company. And of course, this whole tradition of large shareholders and number of shareholders and looking after them and all that. Uh, you are essentially focused on domestic business. But you're in a kind of business which touches the world. And the world touches you big time because you are really an energy and, and focused there. So how, how do you see the world? How, how, how does Reliance manage in this very complex uh, situation? Well, Tarun, uh, let me start by uh, saying that how honored I am to be here. Uh, 
uh, I have uh, grown up admiring uh, General Electric. Uh, when I joined uh, Reliance and my father, right, like Jeff said, Reliance was less than uh, uh, 80 crores in size, which is about 20 million dollars, and I have been very fortunate to be uh, part of a journey from 1980 for the last uh, now nearly 30 years where uh, we have grown the company from 80 crores to next year in excess of 200,000 crores. Through this uh, journey, uh, I have always uh, admired GE and today for you to be in India and for me to be sitting along with you proves that uh, there is an Indian dream that can also come true. Uh, an individual within India, you know, however complex people think that uh, India is, right? India is a great opportunity and an ordinary man can build a world class company. Through this journey, we have had the philosophy of my father that business has to have a purpose and uh, one of those purposes that's dear to my heart is really to meet a missing need in society. So if you see Reliance, we started off in textiles and uh, India had to move to synthetic textiles. If you follow the last 30 or 40 years, uh, the textile industry has moved really from the West to Asia and uh, within that we identified that opportunity, we pursued that and pursued global competitiveness making us today the biggest in polyester. So I still remember in the 80s in Delhi where uh, people would question us in terms of saying can we really be globally competitive. Right? They would put in export obligations and you don't like, oh, well, that, those are days of bureaucracies, Jeff. So they said, I don't trust you guys, like, you know, if you are going to spend my foreign exchange, you better earn it and we'll put an export obligation on you. And uh, uh, come 25 years from now, 70% of uh, Reliance is exports. Uh, we then went on and did the same thing in the plastic industry, which again improves quality of life. We further backward integrated with that and refining. Short time we thought that the uh, communication revolution is going to change the world and India needs a much larger vision and a much faster vision and again I was very fortunate to build that from uh, uh, scratch. And finally uh, we thought that you know a country like India cannot not be endowed with natural resources and we explored on the east coast of India and now we prove to the world that the east coast of India is a, the basins, the hydrocarbon basins there are as rich as anywhere else in the world. So it has been a journey. It, uh, what it has taught me is that if you empower young Indians, the energy and the competence in young Indians is second to none. What they need is opportunity, empowerment, and leadership. And with that, India's time really has come. And uh, uh, lots of people think that uh, uh, India is a country of a billion problems. I am a big believer that India is a country of a billion opportunities. And that's what my 30 years is.